Thank you. Okay. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Aloha. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kirsty McWalter, and I am a genetic counselor with the Hawaii Department of Health Genetics Program, and I'm also a staff person for the Western State Genetic Services Collaborative, who is hosting uh, this webinar today. Uh, so we're pleased to host this webinar focused on severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID, a condition of much recent interest, especially given its uh, addition to the recommended uniform screening panel, or the RUS. Uh, so on behalf of the collaborative, I'd like to welcome our speaker today, who is Dr. Skoda Smith from Seattle Children's Hospital, where she is the clinical director for the Division of Immunology. Uh, for our audience members, if you have any questions during the webinar, please go ahead. Um, you have a couple of options. On your uh, webinar dashboard, there is an option for a chat um, box. You can press the plus button to open that up, and you can write your question in there if you wish. Or if you have a message just for me, something that's um, the matter or you need fixed, you can direct a question directly to me. Um, there's that option below. Um, otherwise, uh, Dr. Skoda Smith has uh, mentioned her preference for actually hearing voices during the webinar, even though we can't see each other's faces. So what I will do after the slide presentation is I will open up um, the line. So currently everybody is on mute. But after the uh, slide presentation, I will open up the line. So if you do have questions at that point, you can also um, ask them yourself of Dr. Skoda Smith. So without further ado, um, please welcome Dr. Skoda Smith. Thank you, Kirsty. I'm um, really glad to be able to join you today, even though I can't see your smiling faces. Uh, Hong Yen and I are sitting in Seattle looking out at the Space Needle, and though it's a lovely view, we would gladly trade the rain and the gray skies for the beautiful weather you're probably experiencing. So I do prefer to hear voices, um, so save your questions until the end, and we can chat about it. Um, I'm one of five immunologists here at Seattle Children's Hospital, and the way we train for our subspecialty is a little bit unusual. We train to take care of both children and adults. So you can come at an immunology um, training through internal medicine or through pediatrics, and I'm a trained pediatrician. You take care of a spectrum from birth to old age, and most of the people who go through this fellowship end up practicing allergy, except for a few of us, like the five of us here in Seattle, who all we do is primary immune deficiency. Um, uh, that's not the usual case, but I'm very happy to have four other colleagues uh, to share my experiences with. I've been practicing for about 15 years or so. I practiced in the state of Florida before coming to Washington. And I'm really very excited to talk about our newborn screening, which just commenced on the 2nd of January. Um, I want to thank Mike Glass, too, who I think is the um, counselor uh, at our State Department of Health who put me in touch with you guys. So our goals today are to introduce what SCID is as an illness, how we diagnose it, talk a little bit about newborn screening for SCID, and I'll give you some of the data from Wisconsin, which is the state that started screening first, how we treat SCID, and then why newborn screening is so important, because there's such a divergence between early versus late treatment. Uh, by way of introduction to the disease, I use these slides to try and convince people at our state level that we should screen for SCID. It took three years. And I guess everybody remembers the Boy in the Plastic Bubble uh, movie with John Travolta. Of course, no one with SCID would ever grow up to be as old as John Travolta, maybe as cute, but not as old. And at the bottom of that flyer, you can see only his love could set him free. And it really should have said only a bone marrow transplant can set him free, because uh, this condition is lethal without definitive treatment by bone marrow transplant or gene therapy. And that was made all too clear by the real bubble boy, whose name was David Vetter. And he was born in the early 70s uh, in Texas, and NASA was in its heyday. 
So they actually constructed a germ-free plastic bubble for him to live in, thinking he could grow up and um, he wouldn't succumb to an overwhelming infection because of his skin. Well, he actually died in his early teens of a malignancy, a lymphoma that was driven by Epstein-Barr virus. So even our best efforts to keep these babies germ-free in, in a bubble do not ensure survival and certainly doesn't ensure quality survival. These are um, the faces of skid. The baby with the blue towel behind him is a six-month-old that a mom brought into our immunology clinic and she was convinced he had food allergies. He wasn't growing well. His hair had fallen out. He had skin rashes. You can see that that one eye is swollen. And he had pus coming out of his ears and thrush in his mouth. And we were unhappy to have to tell her that he didn't have food allergies. He had severe combined immune deficiency. And the swollen eye was a periorbital cellulitis from uh, a bacteria he should be immune to, but wasn't. He had chronically infected ears. He had chronic diarrhea, wasn't growing. And that's him after a bone marrow transplant. And that little guy is probably over 20 now. Um, so we do have highly effective therapies to treat severe combined immune deficiency. And the first bone marrow transplant for SCID was done in 1968, before we even knew any of the genes for it. And that patient is still surviving today. This is to introduce you to my world. What do I take care of as an immunologist? You can see that about 60% of what we see um, are antibody deficiencies. And these are pretty easily treated by giving replacement gamma globulin, either in an IV or subcutaneous form. A smaller percentage are pure cellular immunodeficiencies. And you're probably familiar with the best example of this, which is DeGeorge syndrome. Um, there's a T cell problem. There's typically not an antibody problem that accompanies it. What we're going to be talking about today falls into the realm of combined immunodeficiency. And that is both an antibody and a cellular defect. And that is what SCID is. You can see we take care of some other problems, which we're not going to go into today. So I want to remind you with this slide that the immune system is a cellular system. Um, there are immune organs. There's the thymus, of course, that educates T cells to be in a body. And there's lymph nodes where the immune cells go and get together and talk and have a hoedown and make an immune response. But primarily, your immune system is made in your bone marrow with your other blood components. And it's comprised mainly of the white cells, the T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes your neutrophils and your macrophages, and then plasma components such as complement and antibody. We look at the immune system clinically as a paradigm of four arms, or four armies, if you will. This is uh, what my uh, partner, Troy Torgerson, uses to explain the complexities of the immune system to our patients. And I think it works very well. He compares it to. Uh, a force in a country that protects it. And as such, it has an air force that deploys antibodies, which are smart bombs. And it has T cells, which are the generals. They tell everybody else what to do. They kill the things you don't want around. And they are also psychologists in that they help regulate the other parts of the army. So this, the situation that you have with SCID is you have either no T cells or you have T cells that don't function. As a consequence of not having functional T cells, your B cells don't work well either because your B cells need your T cells to tell them what to do. So you're really left without your whole adaptive immune system. All you're left with is your innate immune system, which is a more primitive system. And this is complement and phagocytes. Remember that your adaptive immune system can actually pick out specific pathogens. Complement doesn't care whether you're tetanus or you're pneumococcus. It attacks everything equally. But your T cells and your B cells can see difference in pathogens. And remember that once they have seen that pathogen, 
they develop memory, they learn, so they're able to come back and make a bigger response with more punch the next time around. So with SCID, you really are left with no adaptive immune system. We're pretty fortunate and have come a long way in the genetics of SCID because most of them are single gene disorders. And that makes them a lot easier to study than some of the complex diseases like lupus and some of the other autoimmune diseases. So there are probably now over 21 defects associated with SCID. Um, the first was an enzyme deficiency called adenosine deaminase deficiency, described here in the 70s by one of our physicians. It is an autosomal recessive form of SCID, as are many of these illnesses. And ADA deficiency is the only form of SCID that has three potentials for treatment. There actually is a pegylated adenosine deaminase that you can infuse in these children. They will recover some T cell immunity. It's not long lived, but it's a nice bridge to transplant. And the other way you can treat ADA deficiency is by gene therapy. It's really the only form of SCID that gene therapy is working well for, and that took about 20 years to, to figure out. We just recently had two little girls who went to UCLA where they have an ADA gene therapy trial, and they're doing beautifully. So our hope is that more and more of these single gene defects will be amenable to repair by uh, gene therapy. And we'll talk a little bit more about the problems with that later on. If you look at the big piece of the pie uh, on the right side that says deficiency of common gamma chain, that is one of the more common forms of SCID, and it's an X-linked disease. A lot of important immune molecules are carried on the X chromosome. And there are quite a number of immune defects that are X-linked. Um, X-linked uh, SCID is also called common gamma chain. Uh, it is a defect in a cytokine signaling chain that's needed for T cell development. So if you hear common gamma chain, you'll know they mean X-linked SCID. There's an unknown piece of the pie there, and it's true that we can clinically define SCID by numbers of T cells and absence of T cell function, and we may not know the gene that's causing it. That still doesn't prevent us from transplanting. There are a number of defects out there that look like SCID that we still don't understand the genetics for. So be prepared for some surprises. The thing that binds all forms of skin is that naive T cells are reduced or absent. The common feature is that these kids have absent or non-functional T cells. If you look at the very top that says IL2R gamma, that's X skid. All skids have a particular fingerprint, if you will, and we use the presence or absence of T cells B cells and natural killer cells to group these forms of SCID into likely genetic defects. So you can see that X-linked SCID, IL-2 receptor gamma, has the same fingerprint as JAK3 SCID, the difference being since IL-2 receptor gamma is on the X chromosome, we only see it in boys, JAK3 is in that same pathway, so it gives you a T negative, B positive, and K negative. Skid, but it's due to an autosomal recessive form uh, of SCID and can be seen in girls as well. There are a lot of other molecules there I won't go into, but they're some of the more common forms of SCID. Go down to where it says severe DeGeorge syndrome. Some forms of DeGeorge can have such profound T cell deficiency that they look like SCID. And this is a good example of how we as immunologists look at these cell fingerprints to try and figure out what genetic defect it might be. So you can see that a complete DeGeorge or severe DeGeorge has absent T cells, might have B cells, just like an X-linked skid, but has NK cells present. So this is just an example of how we use the absence or presence of these forms of cells to give us a ballpark of what form of skid we're looking at. So here's the bottom line in summary, what we see clinically with skid. 
you are going to see children with severe infections in the first year of life, very often viral infections that won't go away or severe fungal infections. We just transferred a little boy over the weekend who's six months old uh, from another part of the state. He looked perfectly healthy until he got RSV pneumonia, um, didn't go away. And then he was also found to have rhinovirus, got worse. He's three weeks in the hospital. His doctors are realizing something is amiss here, something's wrong. He has plenty of lymphocytes, um, but we don't know if they're T cells or B cells. Uh, he then gets worse, deteriorates, and we find out that he has pneumocystis cerevisiae pneumonia, which, if you'll recall, in the early days of the HIV epidemic, that was the sine qua non of opportunistic infections in people with HIV who had non-functional helper T cells. Babies with skids often present with PJP pneumonia, and that's exactly what this little guy has. His doctors measured his antibody levels. They were non-existent. He didn't make antibodies. And when we looked at his T cell numbers, uh, he should probably have 60, 70, 80 percent T cells. He had 2 percent T cells. And his fingerprint looks very much like he may be an X-linked skid. The baby that I've just given you an example of didn't have failure to thrive, but many of these kids present with failure to thrive or chronic diarrhea instead of opportunistic infections. Most of them have a decreased absolute lymphocyte count, or ALC. And you really should be suspicious that something is going on if you see a newborn infant with an absolute lymphocyte count of less than 2,500. Infants are very lymphocyte rich. Uh, as we mentioned before, they're naive or just made. T cells are decreased or absent. Or, or absent. The incidence um, is unknown, but we're getting good estimates from the newborn screening lab. And when I first went to medical school, it was thought that the incidence of skid was about one in a quarter of a million. That came down to about one in a hundred thousand. And now with newborn screening, we're thinking it's going to be about one in fifty thousand. Um, we're going to be identifying infants who otherwise would have died. And there are some conclaves of particular populations, um, there's a Native American uh, population that has a very high incidence of skid, one in 30,000. So it's going to be more frequent, and hopefully we're going to detect it before these kids get severe life-threatening infections that they can't get rid of until they get some T cells. It is 100% fatal without early diagnosis and treatment, so you can see why early diagnosis is crucial. Um, this is even before my time. This is from one of my mentors, and it's a little baby who got the smallpox vaccine. And for those of you who are old enough to remember getting it, it's a live viral vaccine. When babies with skid get a live viral vaccine, they get the disease. They have no T cells to keep uh, that virus under control. So this baby perished from uh, uncontrolled vaccinia from the smallpox vaccine. So diagnosis is reasonably straightforward. Um, when you look at any part of the immune system, whether it's T cell, B cell, neutrophil, or complement, you look at the quantity that's present, and you look at the quality or the function of what's present. You can get an early idea if the child is lived by looking at the CDC and differential and seeing if they have lymphocytes. In many cases of ADA skid, the lymphocyte count will be stunningly low, 100 or 200. Then we quantify TB and NK cells by flow cytometry. And the screening test we're going to be talking about is called TREC analysis. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more. The functional part of the evaluation comes when we take T cells out and put them in a dish and stimulate them. Um, babies with skid who have T cells, when they're stimulated, they do nothing. They don't proliferate. They don't function. So those are the ways we as immunologists clinically define skid, along with skid-defining illnesses. And then, of course, we go on to try to identify what gene the baby has for help with future family planning. So here's an example of a complete blood count. 
where the white count is 7,600, but only 5% lymphocytes. And if you take 5% of 7,600, the baby has an absolute lymphocyte count of only 380. So that's a big clue. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with flow cytometry, so I thought I would just go through it. Because once the TREC analysis is done off the newborn's blood spot, and we'll talk a little more about that in a couple slides, the confirmatory test that we send is a lymphocyte subset analysis by flow cytometry. And on the surface of different immune cells, there are surface molecules that have names. T cells are known because they're CD3 positive. B cells are known because they're CD19 or CD20 positive. So we can make an antibody to that cell marker and attach a little molecule to it that will fluoresce when it's hit by laser light. That's what those little dots of red, green, and blue are. And we can use these labeled cells to put through a flow cytometer. If that marker is on the surface of the cell, the laser will detect it and count it and will generate a plot for us that on one axis will have fluorescence, which indicates whether that marker is present, and on the other axis will have number of cells. So we immunologists look at little dots all the time. And we can quantify T cells, B cells, and NK cells that way. So that's our confirmatory test. The screening test is called TREC analysis, and that stands for T-cell receptor excision circle. Um, go way back in your biology and remember that when a T-cell makes a receptor, and the receptor is what it uses to see its world and recognize a foreign invader, it rearranges its DNA and chops out little circles that are called T-cell receptor excision circles. Those are non-replicating pieces of DNA that the only purpose they have is to tell you, yes, this T-cell has made a good receptor. It's a good, naive T-cell, and it can function. Well, a very smart lady named Jennifer Puck looked at this and said, I wonder if we can quantify the number of treks, because in babies who have lots of naive T cells that have just been rearranged and haven't seen antigen yet, they should have lots and lots and lots of them in their blood. And she did some studies and found out, yes, newborns are trekalicious. They're full of these little excision circles, which tells us that they've made good T cells. As we get older, though, our naive T cells come into contact with pathogens. They get stimulated. They become mature T cells and memory T cells, and they proliferate. So these treks get diluted out. So by the time you're an adult, you have very few treks uh, per microliter of blood. Dr. Puck um, actually begged, borrowed, and, and well, she didn't steal. She got a lot of states to send Guthrie cards on babies to see if this was a feasible test. And lo and behold, this, um, this observation from a lab that T cells make tracks when they become good T cells turned into a very clinically useful test to detect severe T cell lymphopenia in babies. This is from the Immune Deficiency Foundation and shows the states that are screening so far. Um, Washington just started this year. There was a big push early on to get the high population states like um, California, Texas, and New York, and Florida. Uh, Wisconsin was the first state to screen, and I'm going to show you some of their data. Um, and I. I think your screening is linked to Oregon, though I'm not certain. I'd like to hear a little bit more at the end what, what your plans are for screening and what you anticipate. So as you know, Secretary Sebelius uh, uh, recommended that this be added to every state's newborn screening panel 
but of course each state has to find a way to do it. And in Washington, it took about three years because we actually had to get legislative approval to have extra money added to the budget uh, for the newborn screening test. And my class was uh, instrumental in helping us do that. So for the screening test, tracks will be amplified by a molecular technique called polymerase chain reaction. And to make sure your polymerase chain reaction has worked, you need to use an amplification control. And standardly, when you've done PCRs in human cells for whatever product you're looking for, you use a housekeeping gene, something that uh, there should be a lot of in the cell. And it's very common for these tests to use actin, beta actin, as a control. So you know that if you PCR out beta actin and it amplifies and your TREKs do not amplify, that you have a valid test. It wasn't just a failure of the PCR. Um, Wisconsin was the first state to pilot in 2008 uh, off the simple Guthrie cards that we use for all our other newborn screens. It's important for everyone to realize, though, that there really is no standard method used in all states for these screening protocols. There's some guidance for clinical laboratory standards, and I've referenced that approved guideline below. But every state sets their own standard curve, uh, uses their own methodology, so you can't compare TREX per microliter of blood from state to state. Each state will have their own cutoff depending on the method they use for PCR. We have patterned our testing after the Wisconsin protocol. Um, but again, our cutoffs are not the same as Wisconsin because our state lab has tweaked it a little bit to make it quite efficient and cost effective. So once you have a, uh, a presumptive TREX screen, um, a confirmatory panel is done using flow cytometry. And all states use an absolute T-cell count or CD3 count. Um, each state has a little bit different cutoff for that as well, plus or minus a percentage of naive T-cell markers. And that's how we as immunologists decide what uh, screens are truly positive. Here's Wisconsin's um, first three years of data. So we were interested in Wisconsin not just because they've done it the longest, but because they have a pretty similar population to Washington. They're about 70 to 80,000 births a year, and we're about 80 to 90,000 births per year. So they screened over 200,000. Of those infants screened, 72 met the definition for abnormal TREC. I want to make a little caveat here and say every state that screens realizes there's a big difference between a zero TREC and an abnormal TREC. A zero TREC is really something that makes you sit up and take notice. And many states have um, an urgent uh, uh, nomenclature that will notify the immunologist if they truly have no TRECs detected. So back to Wisconsin. Of the 72 abnormal TRECs, when the confirmatory flow cytometry testing was done, about 50 or 60 percent ended up having normal flow cytometry by the cutoff defined. So this is very consistent in what we've seen in California as well. When California published their first two to three years of data, they screened about a million children, and their confirmatory testing showed normal flow in about 50 to 60 percent. So as you look across the state, even though the numbers screened are different based on the populations, this is um, it's pretty similar how things fall out um, and who needs to be followed for a true, true positive. Of the 40% or so that had abnormal flow cytometry, um, a portion of those were found to have a secondary T cell lymphopenia. Remember, this test, the TREC test, while very sensitive for skid, also picks up other conditions that have low T cell counts. And on the next slide, we'll talk about some of those, because some of them you screen for already. 
Uh, the ones that had abnormal flow um, and didn't have a secondary T cell lymphopenia, five of those turned out to be true severe combined immune deficiency, um, severe T cell lymphopenia. Five ended up being reversible, which was uh, pretty interesting. They followed these kids over time, and uh, their lymphocyte counts rose steadily, um, and they did not require treatment. Four of the kids who had true, true uh, track and flow ended up being uh, an immune deficiency we already knew about, the George, that can be associated with severe T cell lymphopenia. I talked about surprises before, and I'm going to use Wisconsin to illustrate um, how interesting this journey is going to be. They screened 70,000 children <laughs> before they got their first true hit. And you know, we were all following them. We were all excited. When are they going to get their first skid? Well, they got their first absent trek, very abnormal flow. And it wasn't any of the known genes for skid. Uh, it fulfilled criteria for skid. And it also had uh, severe neutropenia associated with it. When they did exome sequencing on that baby, they found that the child had a rare immune deficiency that had only been described in one other child before in the literature. And in that child, it had only been associated with severe neutropenia. It's a defect called a RAC2 deficiency, RAC2. And it turns out that the animal models of RAC2 knockouts predicted that that, that defect would have severe T cell defect. Uh, it just had never been seen in a human before. So the first bone marrow transplant done in Wisconsin for skid was actually done for what was thought at that point to be a severe neutrophil deficiency that actually ended up being um, a form of skid. So here are other associations with abnormal TREC screens. Um, prematurity is something every state has had to control for because very premature babies particularly less than 33 weeks, have lower treks. Different states have used different mechanisms, and it usually involves uh, getting a second or third screen. Uh, because as those babies mature in, gestation, in gestational age, as they get to be greater than 37 weeks gestational age, their treks usually normalize, and their, and their lymphocyte counts do too. So that will have to be figured into your screening algorithm. Uh, one of the big categories that kind of makes sense why people would have low T cell counts are conditions that have abnormalities of the lymphatics because the T cells are sequestered either uh, in chylothorax or chyloperitoneum or they're being lost in uh, lymphangiectasias of the gut. Um, so that is another condition that can have an abnormal TREC screen. A number of unspecified chromosomal abnormalities have had abnormal TREC screens. Uh, trisomy 21 is probably one of the more um, uh, well-known ones. And it, it is known that some babies with Down syndrome have lymphopenia, and some of them do have a more significant immune deficiency. Some metabolic disorders in kids with multiple congenital anomalies have uh, turned out to have uh, low TREC screens, and our first baby picked up here actually had uh, a positive metabolic screen, too, on their newborn screen initially. Congenital heart defects are another big player. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or children who undergo cardiac surgery as neonates. Uh, if you get uh, a screen after babies have been operated on in the first week of life for severe congenital heart disease, you know, typically the surgeons lop out the thymus to be able to do the surgery. So you can see an abrupt drop in TREX um, due to the cardiac surgery. Charge syndrome with CHD7 mutations can have variable degrees of immune deficiency. Some are skid-like and some are DeGeorge-like. Ataxia telangiectasia has turned out to be the cause of some of the low TREX that aren't skid. Other third spacing conditions like hydrops or anasarca, again, because you probably sequester some of those T cells. 
can give you low tracks. And this was kind of a surprise to me. Some GI malformations, including gastroschisis, have had low TREK screens. Um, the TREK screens normalize after the surgery is done for the gastroschisis. And no one actually knows what the mechanism is there. Uh, the rare incidence of neonatal leukemia, low tracks, and again, some poorly defined degenerative neuromuscular disorders um, have had low tracks. I should mention here that there are some forms of skid that will not be picked up with the TREK screen. Uh, one of those is milder forms of ADA deficiency. Uh, when the baby is in utero and sharing a circulation with the mom, the mom has adenosine deaminase and can detoxify that pathway. Uh, for the baby. So the baby may be born with normal tracks. There are a couple other variants of skid that we know will not be picked up with the newborn screen. One is called ZAP70 deficiency, and the other one is MHC class 2 deficiency. So just know that even though we have newborn screening, it's not going to be 100%, but it's certainly going to be better uh, than what we have. I wanted to let you know there are a number of resources already printed and already out there that you can access when you start screening. And it's through the Immune Deficiency Foundation. If you go to their website at primaryimmune.org, go to the bottom and click on Quick Links, you'll see the Skid Newborn Screening Campaign. And they actually have a toolkit um, of printed literature that you can use to model your informational pamphlets after. Um, this is uh, a guide for parents following a diagnosis of SCID. Um, they also have an initial contact sheet, and I'll just read uh, some of the language to you. Newborn screening for severe combined immune deficiency and conditions associated with T-cell lymphopenia. So what does an abnormal screening test mean? The screening test shows that your baby has a low number of a type of white blood cells called T cells. Low numbers of T cells can be associated with a genetic condition called SCID, which could place your baby at extreme risk for serious life-threatening infections. The screening test alone cannot be used to make the diagnosis of SCID, which is why a new blood test is needed. So I think it goes through in very parent-friendly language um, uh, about what this means and what the next steps are. And you guys deal with uh, dealing with parents all the time with positive screens. This is our first time as immunologists having to do this. Um, and, and you're telling this family uh, a big deal. It's not just you're going to have to modify your baby's diet. It's that we're going to need to keep your baby safe, and then they're going to need a bone marrow transplant or gene therapy, which is is a pretty, as you can appreciate, a pretty heavy thing to lay on the parent. So the screening test is positive, the confirmatory test is positive, and now we go on to treatment. And before newborn screening, SCID was said to be uh, an immunologic emergency. Uh, you are racing ahead of the clock to try and treat this baby before it gets a life-threatening infection. So our goals for treatment immediately are to treat or, if newborn screen, prevent any infections, start antibody replacement, we can replace the IgG the baby isn't going to make, and start prophylactic antimicrobials so they don't get PJP pneumonia or fungal infections, and then initiate curative therapy, which it was pretty stunning to go to um, the Department of Health and say, we actually have curative therapy for this condition. Um, and once they have the transplant and are through all their transplant-related issues, um, they're not going to be on medicine for life. They're going to be cured. So prior to definitive therapy, the two most important things we counsel providers on for a baby with suspected skid is no live viral vaccines. And for the reason I showed you with smallpox uh, slide. For us right now, this really only uh, pertains to rotavirus. And on the SCID initiative site, there's a pamphlet that um, says why 
babies with skids should not receive the live rotavirus vaccine. They get rotavirus from the vaccine or they shed it chronically. And the second important thing is that any blood products these babies get need to be irradiated and leukodepleted. The irradiation um, stuns or prevents the white blood cells that inevitably are in the red cell or platelet transfusion. It prevents them from proliferating. Babies with skid who have no immune system, if they get any white blood cells transfused into them, and these are competent white blood cells, the baby has no immune system to reject these cells. So these cells set up housekeeping in the baby. They're not the same tissue type, so they recognize the baby is an abnormal host, and they react against the baby. And that's called GBHD, or graft-versus-host disease. It's sort of the opposite of rejection. Rejection is a host trying to reject a graft, but when you give white blood cells, which are part of the immune system, to a baby with no immune system, those white cells see the baby as foreign, and they make them very sick. They attack the gut, the liver, the skin, the lungs, and babies with skid can die from unirradiated blood products from transfusion-associated GBHD. The so leukodepletion is to prevent them from getting CMV, which many people have who donate blood, and the CMV lives in the white blood cells. Once a baby has CMV uh, and has skid, it's, very, it's impossible for them to get rid of it. Uh, it's impossible for them to get rid of EBV or adenovirus or any viral infection that requires competent T cells. And as you know, we don't have a lot of great antiviral therapy out there. So those are the two big take-home messages to keep these kids safe. The immunologist will start regular antibody replacement, medications to prevent them from getting opportunistic infections, and they, they kind of need to be kept in a bubble. They need to be kept away from SIBs. We recently had a baby come in um, who was exposed to a sibling with a cold. Well, it was adenovirus, and the baby uh, with skid came in with disseminated adeno in the lungs, the gut, and the liver, and died. We also advise n not to breastfeed if the mom is CMV positive, because again, you can transmit CMV through the white cells in the breast milk. Um, we're, we'll end with a little discussion of bone marrow transplant, and I'll be happy to answer any other questions on transplant if you have them at the end. You're probably more familiar with transplant for malignant diseases, like the leukemias and lymphomas. There are a number of non-malignant diseases, which some of which you counsel families about, that are cured by transplant, and the severe immune deficiencies, uh, of which SCID is one. Um, it's a primary example of that. So transplant for SCID gives the child an immune system. We give them an immune system to prevent life-threatening infections, but also so they don't go on to have malignancies, which they're prone to, or autoimmune disorders like autoimmune hemolytic anemia or cytopenia because they have a non-functioning, misfunctioning immune system. And our whole goal for transplant for SCID is really to restore T cell number and function. The other things follow. Uh, without definitive treatment, patients with SCID do not survive. Um, it's stunningly true. Allogeneic bone marrow transplant is curative for SCID. Um, gene therapy is uh, working for ADA SCID, and um, there are new trials for X-link SCID. There have been some particular problems with gene therapy for X-SCID, uh, but they're working on overcoming those. When you have a standard bone marrow transplant, you get chemotherapy to get rid of what immune system you have. If you give standard chemotherapy to a child with SCID, they're at increased risk because they often come in with infections or organ dysfunction, pre-newborn screening. And then if you're transplanting these babies at a couple months of age, their livers and their kidneys metabolize drugs differently, so you need to have good pharmacokinetic data for um, the chemo you're giving them. So the whole push has been really not to use standard chemo, but to use less intensive regimens, and those are in widespread use now.
They're usually termed RIC, reduced intensity, or mini transplants. And we've had a lot of luck with a particular chemo called triosulfan that's in wide use in um, Europe. And we have probably 95% success rate using that drug. So here's the bottom line. This is old data from Dr. Rebecca Buckley at Duke, uh, who's transplanted a lot of patients with skin. Some of them have been too sick, many of them, to get any chemotherapy at all before they're transplant. So you just transfuse cells uh, without any preparation. The bottom line is that for children who are greater than three and a half months of age, the survival post-transplant is 66%. If you transplant those infants early, before three and a half months of age, survival improves to 96%. So this was a very powerful piece of data to convince people of the usefulness of newborn screening. And this, of course, reflects the fact that you're preventing these children from getting life-threatening infections before they come to transplant. And we're going to summarize it up. Uh, as I said, we had to convince our people in Washington that SCID met um, newborn screening criteria. It does based on prevalence. Um, it can't be uh, detected by routine physical exam. These babies look completely normal at birth. You can't, uh, you can't, there's no physical diagnosis that will help you at birth. It uh, causes serious medical complications, death. Um, there is a cheap, um, sensitive, and reasonably specific screening test called T-cell receptor excision circle. Most states have uh, priced it out to be about $8 per test. And there is a confirmatory test, flow cytometry. Early detection clearly improves outcome for these babies. And stem cell transplant or gene therapy, a curative therapy. So that is our ultimate goal, cure. Um, I think we're going to see more of these babies. We're going to catch them before they die. But it does beg the question for some of the states who have a lower birth rate, and I'm, you'll have to tell me, I'm guessing Hawaii is maybe 20,000. It's going to be challenging for you because we, with a birth rate of maybe 80,000, have projected that we expect to see maybe one to three cases of true skid per year and then some other combined immune deficiencies that will require other therapy. So I think it's going to be a challenge, particularly for the states with lower birth rates, um, but a challenge that can be overcome and an important one. I never thought I would see this in my lifetime as an immunologist, and um, this is a wonderful era that we are embarking upon. So I'm going to end there and welcome any questions or clarifications. Thank you, Dr. Scotus Smith. That was excellent. I um, I learned a new term, trechalicious. Newborns are trechalicious. That's great. <laughs> um, and yet, you're you're correct. Uh, Hawaii has a birth rate of, you know, between 18 and 19 thousand a year. So definitely much lower than uh, the other states in our regional collaborative. Um, but thankfully, we're hoping to learn from the adventures of those who have gone before us, and also from our Oregon lab, who uh, will be start starting screening for SCID. Um, in the spring. So uh, before I open up the lines uh, for questions, I just have a few reminder, reminders uh, to attendees. Uh, number one is that you can access a recording of this webinar on the Regional Collaborative website, uh, and that is www.westernstategenetics.org. Also a reminder that we do have a future webinar uh, where our region will discuss our state updates in regards to SCID and screening for SCID. And that webinar will be on March the 11th at 3 p.m. Pacific time. And registration information is also available on our website. Uh, and finally, there will be a survey uh, emailed to you following today's webinar. And if you please could take just five minutes, I think, uh, to complete that. Our uh, funders are very interested in um, who is participating in the webinars and what sort of information they are wanting about SCID. So, at the risk of having a clamor of questions, what I'm going to do now is unmute everybody on the phone line. So if you have any background noise, uh, if you could please um, 
less than that as much as possible. Uh, let's see if I can do this. So, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I don't know. Oh, just give me a moment. I apologize, I uh, cannot figure out how to unmute the phone lines. Uh, so if anybody does have a question, there is the either the chat box or the question box um, on your dashboard. Uh, none have come through during the slide presentation, but I'll wait just a few minutes right now in case any attendees would like to type their questions. Okay, I am opening the phone lines. I just figured out I have to do it person by person. So I am currently unmuting everybody. Okay, the phone lines are open, so if anybody does have a question for Dr. Svoboda Smith, feel free to chime in. This is um, Sylvia Mann from the Hawaii Genetics Program. Uh, we just recently had a meeting of our SCID task force, and uh, one of the problems that we have in Hawaii is that we have such mixed race, and so matching for bone marrow transplant is a little more difficult. Um, and we were trying to decide on um, where to send the kids because they aren't going to be doing the bone marrow transplant in Hawaii. And we were questioning whether, or successfully were questioning whether it would be more useful for us to send to a center that did both bone marrow transplant and gene therapy so that the family wouldn't have to move to center if they didn't qualify for the bone marrow transplant, and I don't know um, how the other, how your state's determining which kids get the bone marrow transplant and which states get the gene therapy, and if you are doing the gene therapy at Seattle Children's. In Alaska. Uh, and so there are different sources of stem cells. Um, one is bone marrow and one is uh, cord blood. And for cord blood, uh, we often have a better chance of finding a match because you don't need to be as stringently matched for cord blood. So just know that there are different options for stem cell sources. Uh, you can even use a parent, but you have to do special manipulation. Uh, to get rid of the T cells that are dissimilar to the baby. I think the bottom line is to look at and send to centers that um, do transplant and or gene therapy all the time because one size isn't going to fit all. Um, certainly San Francisco has a large program, as do we. San Francisco um, is not doing gene therapy that I'm aware of. UCLA is the only one on the West Coast that is doing gene therapy for the one form of skid that it is working in. 
So ADA SCID is the one form of SCID right now that has gene therapy working very, very well. Um, we are going to be bringing on a protocol for gene therapy of X-linked SCID uh, beginning this year. We're collaborating with St. Jude's on this. They have uh, the vector and the gene up and running. So we plan to bring on about one gene therapy trial per year after we get our, uh, our trial going for X-SCID. So yeah, I think you should probably have conversations uh, with the major uh, centers on the West Coast. And we'd certainly uh, be happy. And I'd involve my colleague, Troy Torgerson, who's the director not only of our diagnostic lab, but um, of our clinical uh, stem cell transplant program um, to chat with any of you on a conference call. Those are all really important considerations, especially in the population uh, you outline. This is Kirsty. There have been a couple of questions uh, typed in. Uh, so the first one, what problems have gene therapy trials encountered that we will need to, that will need to be overcome? That's a great question. The first problem that were, have already been overcome is we thought it was going to be really easy. We'd have to give no chemo, and it took 20 years to work that out for ADA skid. So we've got the gene expressing very well in ADA skid. They get a little bit of light chemo um, to get the gene to, to take, and you have to stop their medication, the pegylated ADA. For the other forms of skid, particularly X-linked skid, there was a British and French trial uh, using a different vector, and it had a high incidence of leukemia with the gene integrating into off-target sites. So the new trial that we'll be conducting uh, has a number of safeguards. Uh, put into the gene vector we're using. It self-inactivates. It's a different vector that doesn't integrate near sites that are likely to turn on oncogenes. But off-target insertion and um, uh, causing cancers, at least for X-linked skid, has been the big, big problem in the European trials that were done several years ago. Okay, thank you. And then uh, another question. How do you determine which newborns need gene therapy versus transplant? So the easy answer is currently there's only, there's gene therapy working well for only one form of SCID. That's ADA SCID. My first choice really for any baby with ADA SCID, unless they had a matched related sibling donor, uh, would be gene therapy. Um, for the other forms of SCID, you will be talking about enrolling the infant in a trial, and those trials will have different enrollment criteria. Some trials will not enroll if they have a matched related sibling donor, because generally the results with matched sibs are so good. Each patient is different, though. It depends on what type of SCID it is, what comorbidities they have, and what their donor source is. So we have what's called a non-malignant transplant board that um, rests here in Seattle. We, uh, we broadcast all over the country, though. We have a number of centers uh, that transplant non-malignant patients, and we run it like a tumor board. We present the patients, the immunologists are there, the transplanters are there, and we have really a quite free-ranging discussion of what this patient's unique issues are and what the board recommends would be the best way to go forward. So we're used to doing a very collaborative uh, interaction with our transplanters and the other people who are um, opening our protocols. It's not a, an, an easy one-size-fits-all answer, but for right now, ADA skid, that's your only really solidly working gene therapy. All the others will be clinical trials. OK, and the next question, can the TREC test be done at the two-week well baby exam along with their PKU? I'm in Oregon, so we currently don't test for SCID. 
Yeah, it can be done off of any time you, you get a Guthrie card in um, different states you got different ways. I learned in Washington, we're one of the states that always gets two cards at birth and then at a month, which is nice for us because we, you know, we have a built-in two-card two system. So every state has adapted it um, to how they obtain their newborn screening. Um, and that'll be part of the decision of how you do your algorithm. Okay, and then uh, the last question has to do with um, asking if the PowerPoint slides will be available. Uh, as I mentioned, this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available on our regional collaborative website, which is www.westernstategenetics.org. I'm not sure if Dr. Skoda Smith also wants to share it as a PowerPoint presentation. Um, sure. I probably will just take out a couple of the photos, but everything else um, that's germane, I think that would be great. Okay. Fantastic. Um, if you could send that my way, and then if anybody uh, would like access to that, you can email myself, Kirsty, K-I-R-S-T-Y, at hawaiigenetics.org, and our contact information is also on our westernstatesgenetics.org uh, website. So those are all of the uh, questions that were typed in. If anybody has any last questions, uh, you can go ahead now. And hearing none, we are right on time. I would like, again, to extend our thanks to Dr. Skoda Smith. That was an excellent presentation, and I'm sure everybody learned a lot this afternoon. Uh, and thank you so much for giving up your time uh, putting together the presentation and for speaking with us today. Thank you, Christine. Good luck as you go forward with your newborn screening. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Aloha. Aloha.